بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا ثم ما بعد in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the especially merciful, we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our dear and beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon his pure family, his good companions, and all of those who would try to follow in their footsteps until the day of judgment. So inshallah, before we begin, we just wanted to humbly request for any of the sisters downstairs who wish not to be disturbed, and for the ease of listening, and also for the ease of uh, when it comes to the questions and answers, we just ask that you come upstairs and sit in the back where we normally have uh, the space for the sisters. Alhamdulillah. Things are already set up there. Um, was there any other suggestions you guys? Hadha huwa? Um, no. And then if you do, alhamdulillah, you can come and there is there are books in the back. Maybe you want to leave some copies back there for the sisters, inshallah. There's copies of the book that we're gonna be covering, inshallah, that are there in the back on the sister's side. Do you see the books over there? Okay, all right. Might make sense, one. you might wanna grab one there, inshallah. Tayyib. So, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start then, inshallah. It is 6.30 right now, 6.29, exactly. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan laysa munhasira ala ayadihi ma yakhfa wa ma zahara ثم الصلاة وتسليم المحيمن ما حب سبا فأضر العارض المطر على الذي شاد بنيان الهدى فسما وساد كل الورى فخرا وما افتخر نبينا أحمد الهادي وعترته وصاحبه كل من آوى ومن نصر وبعد فالعلم لم يظفر به أحد إلا سما وبأسباب العلا ظفرا لا سيما أصل علم الدين إن به سعادة العبد والمنجا إذا حشرا as to what follows. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We want to welcome brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, for our workshop titled Welcoming the Honored Guest, which is the month of Ramadan, where inshallah ta'ala, God willing, myself, as well as uh, Shaykhuna Ilyas Way is going to be covering um, the main and most important and critical things that we need to know in order to prepare for Ramadan, in order to best benefit and maximize uh, from Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. So we're going to be covering um, the things like the virtues of Ramadan, the wisdom behind fasting and the month of Ramadan, its rulings, the rulings regarding i'tikaf, as well as a number of other things, inshallah, all of the different things that a servant needs in order to be best prepared and best uh, maximize the benefit that they can from this wonderful and beautiful month that is quickly approaching us, the month of Ramadan. So inshallah ta'ala, before we do that, there were three things that I wanted to do first, inshallah. Uh, one is to give a quick and brief introduction to the author of the book that we're covering, which by the way, there are copies of the book there, inshallah. If you don't have it already, please make sure to get it. Um, wanted to cover a quick brief introduction and like bio, brief bio of the Sheikh who authored this book and wrote this book because he's no doubt a gem that we have here in the state of Minnesota. Dare I say in all of the United States, Alhamdulillah, we're fortunate enough to have him here. He was a tremendous scholar by the name of Sheikh Walid Idris Al-Manisi al sulamiyu And inshallah, I'm going to share a little bit about him and then a couple of more points before we get started, inshallah. Um, so the first thing about the Sheikh is, Kunya, his name is Abu Khalid, and Walid ibn Idris ibn Abdul Aziz Al-Manisi al sulamiyu Al-Iskandari. And by the, you're not going to find it in the, in the book. You have to go to his website if you want to. See it, inshallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, but anyways, he's from Alexandria, Egypt, or Iskandaria. He was born in 1967. Um, he is currently the Ra'is. And by the way, as I said, it's going to be real brief. I'm not going to cover everything. But uh, I just want to mention some things about him and, and talk a little bit about him before we start into the book, inshallah. Um, so anyways, he's currently the president of the North American Imams Federation, which is a organization that has more than 370 imams throughout the United States who are part of that organization. And alhamdulillah, he is the president 
uh, of that organization, as well as the, the president of the Islamic University of Minnesota. And he is also um, an instructor or a professor with the um, American Open University and has been for several years. And he's also one of the, or a part of the council for the American Muslim Jurist Association, alhamdulillah, and also he's a professor at the Graduate Theological Foundation, which is in Indiana. Um, alhamdulillah, the sheikh, he studied in the College of Alexandria, where he specialized in the Arabic language, and then he got his master's from the same university in fiqh, and he got his doctorate in the Dirasat al Islamia or Islamic studies, right? And so, that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. It literally covers two to three pages, all of the different sheikhs and scholars where he has an ijazah, right, which is a sanad going back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are too many to mention, specifically in just the science of the Quran. So anybody who wants to know more about that, you can go to almanisi.com. But the sheikh is well versed in the, in the Quran and is well known for that. But what I wanted to share, just so that people can have an idea of the Shaykh and the depth and breadth of his studies. So just some of his Shaykhs, some of his teachers who he studied with, right? That he studied Hadith, Fiqh, Usul, Aqidah, Tafsir and Lugha. So that would be in Hadith, the science of the prophetic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, Usul, legal maxims, which is a branch of uh, Fiqh, and then also Aqidah, which is Islamic uh, creed or theology, in Tafsir, which is the explanation of the Quran, exegesis of the Quran, and then um, and also in the sciences of language, all right? I'm just going to name some of the sheikhs. The first sheikh that he studied over eight years with is one of the most renowned scholars in contemporary times, is Sheikh uh, Abdul Aziz bin Bas, rahimahullah, who passed away. Um, but he studied with him for over eight years with that sheikh, alhamdulillah. And anybody who is a student or is even a nominally uh, serious student would know who Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah is, who's authored a number of books. He used to be the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah, and taught for a number of years, but he studied with that Sheikh, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, uh, Sunan uh, Al-Nasai, Wa Al-Darimi, Wa Musnad Imam Ahmed, and a number of other books. The, another Sheikh is Sheikh Abdul Razak Afifi, and he stayed with him for five years, La Zamahu which he's like stuck closely to him, like we typically think of like traditionally, like you go with one sheikh, one teacher, and you're just with him all the time, studying with him and being with him. He was with that sheikh for five years, who's also one of the well-known and re renowned scholars uh, in Saudi Arabia. Another sheikh is Sheikh Mohammed bin Saleh al-Uthaymeen, who is also a well-known scholar. He studied a number of different uh, matun and books with him, over a number of years, and then also Sheikh Abdullah bin Jibreen, rahimahullah, where he studied with him uh, Aqidah, and also Sheikh Saleh bin Fawzan and Fawzan. Now, most of these names, some of y'all might not know who these names are, but for those, for us who went overseas and studied, like these were like, for lack of a better word, like superstars amongst the scholars uh, of of their time. They were like so renowned and, 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 um, and well-known, right? And respected and notable scholars who did a tremendous amount of work in spreading the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and teaching the, their people and, and teaching uh, those all over the world. Alhamdulillah. You still, so today, they, a number of, almost all of those sheikhs, they're in somewhere in, uh, in, in my library. A number of, their, of the books that I have are the books of these, of these sheikhs. Matter of fact, I think Sheikh Elias has Sheikh Uthaymin's book right there. So we are greatly, greatly indebted to them. But Sheikh Walid, who is one of the scholars of this city, right, had the great fortune and blessing to have studied with them. And so the reason why I'm pointing this out, uh, because there, there's much more to say about him, uh, is that 
a lot of times people ask, where can I study? Do I gotta go overseas? Where are teachers? Where are scholars? And so on and so forth. And there are even some who speak Arabic who ask that question and they don't know who the Sheikh is. And they never heard of him. And they consider themselves to be serious students Right? But many of us miss the fact that he is a local imam here. He's the, te- uh, he's the imam of Masjid Dar al Farooq uh, Center out in Bloomington. And alhamdulillah, he teaches approximately six days a week. And he teaches various different matun and different books. And he had most of the hufad, most of the students who've memorized Quran, especially with the various recitations and modes of recitation of the Quran, most of them here in Minnesota have studied under him and taken ijazah from him, right? Even many of the imams of the masajid here. Matter of fact, if you go to his halaqa on Friday night, you will find a number of the imams of the masajid here in the Twin Cities, many of them are sitting in, under his halaqa, right? And so, um, alhamdulillah, that is a huge blessing that we have here in Minnesota uh, for to have such a sheikh who is actively teaching and actively propagating the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the book of Allah, according to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and understanding the salaf. That is something that is uh, sometimes can be rare. There are some from the people of the past who used to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadani uh, ila al-Islam wa alhamdulillah alladhi hadani ila sunnah They would say, all praise and thanks is due to Allah who guided me to Islam and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guided us to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And some would say, alhamdulillah, or all praise and thanks is due to Allah, who guided me to a teacher of the sunnah. Someone, a teacher who is upon the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so for that reason, alhamdulillah, the shaykh, he has a number of different works, a number of different books. Some are brief explanations, some are... Um, explanations of other books uh, of the past, and he also has some books that he himself has authored, and, this, and this, this is one of those books that we're going to be covering, inshallah. The name of this book, which you have now, is called Al-Majalisu Al-Ramadaniyya, the Ramadan sittings or gatherings. Also, I think it's translated as Ramadan lounging sessions, but I would prefer Ramadan sittings or gatherings, right? And so, alhamdulillah, what we're going to be doing, there's 12 chapters in this book. There's 12 chapters. Inshallah, we're going to do our best, uh, myself and Elias, to cover all of the chapters. Alhamdulillah, and the way we're going to go about doing that, inshallah, the first two chapters will be covered by myself. And then the next chapters will be, Sheikh Elias, remind me, chapters... Three, four, five, eight, and nine will be covered by Elias. That'll be the second session. And in between there, we'll have a break between myself and then him. Have like a five-minute break or so. And then, inshallah, the third session will be myself, which will be the remaining chapters. We jumped a little bit out of order, right? Because then after that, we're going to be going six... um, 6, 7, 11, and 12 after that, inshallah, all right? So, um, also, the way we're going to go about this, inshallah, is we're going to try to um, cover what the sheikh is saying and just add brief commentary to it, add brief commentary to it. Because really, alhamdulillah, the sheikh, uh, hafizahullah, did most of the heavy lifting, right? Really... Any of you can go back and read this book, and it would be extremely, extremely beneficial. Even if you didn't have some teacher or someone um, explaining it for you, it would still be very beneficial because he brings the main points that you need to know with their evidences, alhamdulillah. But there are some things that we just wanted to add a few uh, commentaries on and things that we felt would be beneficial for us and our community, alhamdulillah. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and accept it from us. Allahumma ameen. Um, so that was the uh, second thing. The third thing and the last thing, inshallah, and then we'll get started, is I wanted to uh, mention a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala an, um, wherein they both said, 
we witnessed that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, لا يقعد قوم يذكرون الله عز وجل إلا إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده. And you'll find this in Sahih Muslim. Don't worry, it's not in the book. I'm not going. I touched the book yet, inshallah. But I wanted to mention this, that both Abu, uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu an and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala an, they both mentioned that they saw the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and heard him say that um, there isn't a group of people that sit down, yaqudu, that sit down and come together for the purpose of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yadhkurun Allah. They come together for the purpose of what? Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except that they are, that tranquility descends upon them, and they are enshrouded and engulfed by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as if that wasn't enough, as if that wasn't enough, the angels surround them. Because the angels, they're created solely for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they love worship wherever it may be happening. So when, it, when it's happening, and there are people who are remembering Allah, they flock to those places. So that means right now, at this moment, we are surrounded by angels. That's what that would mean. And then as if that wasn't enough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ups it even more and says, uh, And the Prophet sallallahu said, وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those people by name with who is with him. And who's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who's that? The angels. So that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bi'ithnillah, is mentioning yourself and mentioning yourself right now to the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. And he's mentioning to Mikail. And he mentions those people who when they come together for the purpose of not just not to eat together, not to draft up a business plan, but for the remembrance of Allah, they get all of these things. The tranquility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of Allah, that the angels surround them and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the, uh, in the gathering of angels, which obviously is far better gathering than this. And so we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this of those gatherings, that it, tranquility descends upon it and that it is a, uh, a gathering of mercy and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention us with, uh, to the angels. Allahumma ameen. So without further ado, inshallah, we will start. Oh, and I wanted to add one more thing, inshallah, is if someone could keep time. Just give me about 25 minutes. Tayyip? Huh? Tell me then. Uh, is about questions and answers. That was one more thing I wanted to mention. About questions and answers, if it's easier, the sisters, you can simply write down if you have any questions and just have uh, someone young go back there and then uh, bring it up. Um, and also for the brothers, you can simply ask the questions. But what we will do is we'll try to leave the questions if possible, again, because our time is limited, but the amount of information we want to cover is quite a bit. So if we could leave the questions till the, the end of each session, so not to the, the end of the whole thing, but to the end of the session, if it's about what's being talked about. If it's about what's being talked about, at the end of the session, you have a couple minutes to ask a few questions. Then at the end, at the end of everything, we'll leave a big uh, gap of time, between maybe half an hour or so, or uh, if, if more is needed, mashallah, then it'll be open for questions, inshallah. Does that sound all right? Yes. Is that good, Sheikh? Okay, alhamdulillah. By the way, if, if anybody, brother, there's uh, books back there if you don't. Okay, alhamdulillah. No. So, al fasl al-awwal, fadail shahir Ramadan. So the first chapter is about the virtues of the month of Ramadan. And in it, the Shaykh, he says, Shahru Ramadan, ja'alahu Allahu ta'ala musiman aliman min mawasim al ta'at, man wafakahu Allahu ta'ala fihi li ta'atihi faqad faza, wa man khadala fihi faqad halak. Shahru Ramadan, qala Allahu ta'ala fihi, Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, hudan lil nasi, wa bayyinati min al-huda wa al-furqan, fa man shahida minkum al-shahra fal yasum. Huh? 
Back there? Okay. No. So the first thing that the Shaykh he says is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the month of Ramadan a blessed, a blessed season, a blessed and tremendous season for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, but whoever is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then no doubt they have, they're successful. Right? Because there are people that we see, they might be some people that you know that you go to school with, and they reach the month of Ramadan, but for some reason, they're not busy with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're busy with everything else other than that. So the Shaykh, he says, so whoever is blessed to reach that month and be busy with ibadah, with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he's successful. And if they are busy with otherwise, then no doubt they're in tremendous loss. And then he mentions the ayah wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, that the month of Ramadan is the month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an, guidance for mankind, وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ And it is a clarification uh, from guidance and a criterion, meaning between truth and falsehood. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُونَ And so whoever of you sees or witnesses the month of Ramadan, then go ahead and fast. So a couple of things about this verse is firstly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this month, yani the month of Ramadan, obviously not this month, the month of Ramadan, to be the month that he sent down the Qur'an, which that in and of itself shows how unique and special the month of Ramadan is versus all of the 11, uh, the other months. The fact that he chose to send down the Qur'an. And as a matter of fact, Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he mentions that even previous books were sent down in the month of Ramadan. What was sent down to Jesus, alayhi salam, the Injil, According to Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he says it was sent in the month of Ramadan. And what was sent to Musa, alayhi salam, the same thing, sent down in the month of, uh, the month of Ramadan. Um, and not only that, but it was sent as a guidance for mankind, yani the Qur'an. And inshallah, we'll talk uh, about that later when it comes to uh, the month of Ramadan being the month of the Qur'an. We'll go more into detail about that. وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ and the word furqan, meaning criterion, distinguishing between truth and falsehood, between what is right and what is wrong. If you want to be able to do that, you need the Qur'an. You need the Qur'an, because that's what the Qur'an does, right? And um, something to note about that, what was the nickname of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu? SubhanAllah. Nobody's ever heard the sira, his sirah, his story? Huh? Al Farooq. Right? Which is from the same, which is a, a derivative of this word. Right? Al Farooq, the distinguisher between that which is right and that which is wrong. That was the nickname of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, because of how ardent he was and how steadfast he was upon the truth and the strength of his conviction that even shaytan, na'udhu billahi minhu, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from him, even he, even shaytan, iblis, if Umar ibn Khattab, al-Farooq, was to walk on one side of a street, then the shaytan would walk on the other side. That's how much he was a distinguisher between what is right and what is wrong, that the falsehood would run away from him. But Al-Muhim, the word Furqan, the Qur'an, which is one of the names of the Qur'an, is that it distinguishes between what is right and what is wrong, and Allah chose to reveal it in the month of Ramadan. So then we have the, the, the Shaykh, he mentions the hadith, عن جابر بن سمرة رضي الله عنه قال, قال uh, سعد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المنبر فقال آمين 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 قال أتاني um, <coughs> قيل يا رسول الله إنك حين سعدت المنبر قلت آمين 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 قال أتاني جبريل عليه السلام فقال يا محمد من أدرك أحد والديه فمات فدخل النار فأبعده الله من قل آمين فقلت آمين قال يا محمد من أدرك شهر رمضان فمات فلم يغفر 
له فأدخل النار فأبعده الله قل آمين فقلت آمين قال ومن ذكرت عنده فلم يصل عليك فمات فدخل النار فأبعده الله قل آمين فقلت آمين رواه ابن حبان وطبراني وغيره so uh, Jabir ibn Samara one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said so he's sitting with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam right in the masjid okay the companions are there and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam if y'all can you see over there brother the stairs right the member of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has three steps all right the member or the pulpit of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has three steps and so the Prophet Sallallahu began going up the steps. And each step that he took, he said, Ameen. Then he would take another step and he would say, Ameen. Then he took another step. He said, Ameen. How many times, Chef? Three. Three times. And when he did this, the companions, all they see is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Ameen, 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 while he's going up the stairs, which to them obviously isn't normal. Because when do you usually say ameen? After a dua or a supplication, when somebody makes a prayer. And then you would say ameen, right? So they don't see that though. They just see the Prophet ﷺ saying ameen, ameen, ameen. So it was said to him, right? It said, Qila, Ya Rasulullah. So somebody said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when you went up the member, you said ameen three times. Why did you do that? So he said, Atani Jibreel. He said that the archangel Gabriel, alayhi salam, came to me and when he did he said <clears throat> he said to me O oh Muhammad whoever anyone who one of their parents if just one of their parents Ahad Walidayh is alive uh, and then that person dies meaning their parents like reach old, old age and then you die, right? Meaning they've lived for a while. Like you, got, you became an adult and your parents were still alive and then you died after. And even though that happened, that you grew up into adulthood and one, one or both of your parents were alive and you enter to the fire after you die, may Allah, yani, yani, Allah. May he be cast away. May he be far away. What does Jibreel alayhi salam mean by this? We'll get to that, inshallah. Then he says, قَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ مَنْ أَدْرَكَ شَهْرَ رَمَضَانَ فَمَاتْ فَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهْ فَأُدْخِلَ النَّارِ فَأَبْعَدُهُ اللَّهِ قُلْ أَمِينَ Or excuse me, and then after the Jibreel, he said that the first thing about the parents, he told that, he said, he made a dua, or rather he made a curse, he said, may Allah cast that person away or make him far away. And then he told the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say Ameen. And the Prophet said, Ameen. Then he said about the month of Ramadan, O Muhammad, if anybody reaches the month of Ramadan and they die and they are not forgiven and then after that they enter the fire, he said the same thing. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala cast that person far away. And then he told the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say Ameen. So what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He said, Ameen. Then he went on to say, <clears throat> the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, he said, قَالَ وَمَنْ ذُكِرْتَ عِنْدَهُ فَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْكَ فَمَاتَ So whoever you are mentioned, meaning if the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is mentioned, and they don't send salams on you, والصلات salams on you, and then they die, and they enter the fire, the same thing, may Allah cast that person away. And he said, say Ameen. And what did the Prophet said him do? He said, Ameen. And you can find this in uh, Ibn Hibban and Tabarani and other places as well. So now we see that the angel Jibreel made three, you don't, we don't even want to say du'as. He made three curses. He cursed three different people or categories of people rather. Right? The person who their parents reach old, uh, that you reach, you grow up to be an adult and you don't take care of your parents. Because if that happens, 
that you go to the hellfire in spite of the fact that your parents reached old age. What should you be doing if your parents reached old age? That's what I should be saying. What should you be doing? If one or both of your parents reach old age? Take them to the old home? Put them in the senior, senior care? You should be serving your parents and taking care of them. That is one of the most important and fundamental values in Islam is taking care of our parents and the elderly. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in another hadith, مَن لَمْ يُوَقِّرْ كَبِيرَنَا وَيَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا فَلَيْسَ minna. The ones who don't honor the elders of our community and respect them. يعني يُوَقِّرْ كَبِيرَنَا وَلَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا And they don't... Uh, have mercy on the young, then they're not even from us. Those are my people. Because the people of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they take care of their parents. They take, they take care of their mothers and fathers. And so the angel Jibreel, even though he didn't say that, he said, whoever's parents reach old age, and then they go to, and then that person, he dies and goes to the hellfire, that means you must not have been taking care of your parents. That's what that means. You must not have been taking care of your parents. Because that's a huge opportunity for reward, somehow you miss that opportunity, and that's one of the reasons why you're in the hellfire. So may Allah cast you away. So one of the things that shows from this hadith, the first thing is that, the obligation of taking care of our parents. And the month of Ramadan is also a tremendous opportunity to do so. To take care of your parents, bringing them food for them, making sure that they don't have any needs during the month, if they, li if they, if they, if they live with you, if they don't, if they live somewhere else, checking up on them, calling them, visiting them. If they live in a different country or they live in a different state, just call and see how you're doing. And using all the different means, Skyping them, FaceTiming them so they can see your face, right? But taking care of your parents. The second thing from this hadith, which obviously is the most relevant here, is the angel Jibreel, he said, whoever reaches the month of Ramadan and is not forgiven, and then after that he dies and then enters the fire. فَعَبَادَهُ خلاص. That person too, cast him away. Why? Because this person, whoever he or she might be, they had this tremendous opportunity the month of Ramadan. Didn't get forgiveness, that means they miss that huge opportunity. Which means who can they blame? They can only blame themselves. And then they enter the fire. So the angel Briel's like, خلاص, man. Just make dua against that guy. Khalas, he deserves whatever he's getting. فَعَبْعَدُهُ Allah. May Allah cast him away, because wherever he is right now, he deserves to be there. And of course, the, he told the Prophet ﷺ, say ameen, and he did. And then the third thing was, whoever the Prophet ﷺ is remembered, or his name is mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and someone doesn't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, doesn't send salams, doesn't send prayers on him, Right? And same thing. And they die and they enter the hellfire. Allah, same thing. Allah, may Allah banish that person. Again, huge opportunity for good in such a small, insignificant like I don't want to say insignificant, but such a small thing, just you saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How much time does that take from you, Shaykh? Huh? If that, two seconds. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Doesn't cost Right? But we owe the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There would, there would not be this delta. There would not be the prayers. These masajid would not be here had it not been for the sacrifices and the efforts of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, after Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, thumma, right? But he sent the message to somebody. Somebody had to endure. And somebody had to convey. Somebody had to be patient. Somebody had to teach, right? And that's Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So every time you hear his name, we owe it to him that we say, every time we hear his name, we say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you don't do that, again, another opportunity. And notice I'm saying each of these are tremendous opportunities, right? That when you miss those opportunities, what I understand from this hadith, pretty much Jabril is saying, like, it's your own fault. And he's making dua against you. If you did that, that's your own fault. That's why you're in the hellfire. May Allah cast you away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the hellfire. Allahumma ameen. So anyways, so now the next thing that we take is that the obligation of sending salat was salams ala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is an obligation on every single Muslim. 
and we should teach our children that they say, that they say this. Every time they hear Prophet Muhammad or Rasulullah or Nabiullah or Muhammad, they should say what? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And us as parents, those of you who are teachers, those of you who are uncles, those of you for your relatives, you, you should teach everybody that they should say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every time they hear that. Now. So the next thing the Sheikh he says, فما ظنكم بدعوتي دعاه دعاها الروح الأمين وأمن عليها سيد المرسلين. The Sheikh goes on to say, so what do you think about the one who is the ruh al-amin, the trustworthy soul, which is another name for the angel Jibril عليه السلام? He said, what do you think about the dua that he makes and that the one who is Sayyid al-Mursaleen, the one who is the master of all of the messengers, he says, ameen, to the dua that the, the angel Jibril makes. He said, what do you think about that dua? Do you think it's going to be answered? Sisters, y'all think it's that dua is going to be answered? If the angel Jibril makes dua and Prophet Muhammad says, ameen, on that dua, you think it's going to be answered? Absolutely. Of course it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that, from that curse. Allahumma ameen. So, anyways, he said, لَقَدْ كَانَ السَّلَفُ الصَّالِحِ رِضْوَانُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ يَدْعُونَ اللَّهَ سِتَّةَ أَشْهُرٍ أَنْ يُبَلِّغَهُمْ رَمَضَانِ ثُمَّ يَدْعُونَ اللَّهَ سِتَّةَ أَشْهُرٍ أَنْ يَتَقَبَّلَ مِنْهُمْ وَمَا ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِمَا عَلِمُوهُ مِنَ الْفَضَائِلِ الْعَظِيمَ لِهَذَا الشَّهْرَ الْمُبَارَكِ they would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the months that are uh, preceding Ramadan. The ones that are preceding Ramadan, they would be asking, oh Allah, please accept our, uh, allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. And you hear it now, you're going to be hearing it all the time. Any message you go to now, right? Any message you go to now, you're going to hear, Allahumma, huh? What's the dua you're going to hear about reaching the month of Ramadan? Anybody know here, know Arabic? Allahumma ba, huh? Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. And this was the habit of the people before us, right? And then the other six months, they would be saying to Allah, Oh Allah, please accept from us. Please accept, or five months really, because one month, right? They would be asking for the next five months, Oh Allah, accept from us the Ramadan that we just did. Right? Because of the virtues that they knew that were entailed in that month, from the mercy, from the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, from the opportunity to gain taqwa and to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strengthen our spirituality, to strengthen our relationship, to better ourselves, to overcome different bad habits. They understood that that's what the month of Ramadan was about. And so they used to beg Allah, oh Allah, please don't let us die before that month comes. And oh Allah, once we reach it, oh Allah, please allow us to benefit as much as possible, or please, please uh, accept it from us, everything that we did. The reading of the Qur'an, the standing in the uh, Qiyam al-Layl, the sadaqah that you give, the charity that you might, all of that, right? Now, and so, um, not only that, but the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the Shaykh, he goes on to uh, say, وَكَانَ نَبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يُبَشِّرُ أَصْحَابَهُ بِدُخُولِ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ فَيَقُولُ لَهُمْ كَمَا جَاءَ فِي حَدِيثَ أَبِي هُرَيْرَ رضي الله عنه قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَمَضَانِ شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ افترض اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ صِيَامَهُ تُفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَحِيمِ وَتُغَلُّ فِيهِ الشَّيَاطِينِ فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ رواه إمام أحمد والنسائي وغيره So now the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to as an encouragement to his companions right he used to tell them in glad tidings Glad tidings, be happy, everybody. Alhamdulillah. Qad ja'akum Ramadan. The month of Ramadan has come to you. Alhamdulillah. This is glad tidings for you. Right? It is a shahrun mubarak. It's a blessed month. And in this blessed month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it an obligation upon you to fast during this month. And iftarad Allahu alaykum al siyama. Tuftahu fihi abwabul al jannah. The gates of paradise are flung open during this time. And the gates of the hellfire are closed. And not only that, but the shayateen, 
تغلو, which means that they are chained up. And the ulama, they explain this تغلو, it doesn't mean that they're just chained up, right? But it means their hands are chained up, their necks are chained up, and even their legs are chained up. طيب. So this is, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his mercy has flung open the doors of paradise, closed the doors of the hellfire, and, clo and, and uh, chained up the, the shayateen, again, to create an opportunity for brothers and sisters, for the Muslims, for the believers, to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam? And then not only that, he goes on to say, Laylatun, Fihi Laylatun Khayrun Min Alfi Shahrin, Man Hurimaha Khayraha Fakad Hurim. And in that month is one night that is better than a thousand months. It's better than a thousand months. And whoever is, uh, doesn't get the blessings of that month, then that's, that's on him. فَقَدْ حُرِمْ يعني That's on them. So just quickly, how, much, how many years is ألف, ألف, uh, ألف شهر? A thousand months. How many years is that? If we got any math magicians out here. No, don't use a calculator, brother. I could have done that. Hmm? Eight, wow. Allahu Akbar. Yes, exactly. It's 83.3333333 three months. Uh, years, excuse me. 83 years. That's, again, the blessings of Ramadan. That in one night, right? And of course, what is that night that we're talking about? Laylat ish? Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahar. It's better than 83.33333 years of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just one night. Again, showing the expansiveness and generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That those who are busy trying to catch that night, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for them. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to catch the month of uh, the Laylatul Qadr. Allahumma ameen. Then the Shaykh goes on to say, Kam adnabna wa qasarna fi rajabin wa sha'ban fa'alayna an nastadrik an nastadrika ma fata wa nu'awiduhu bil ihsani fi shahr fi shahri Ramadan. And so the Shaykh goes on to say, How much have we yani, messed up? How many sins do we have or that we've collected kind of like Kind of like the fifth filth and the dirt that you collect when you're going on the street, when you're walking on a tra and traveling, right, on a dusty road. What happens when you travel on a dusty road? Let's say you got like a white garment on. What's going to happen to the garment? It's going to get dusty. It's going to get dirty. And that's kind of like what this life is like. When you go through it and you live your day-to-day -day life, whether it's through your work, your school, your different responsibilities and stuff like that, يعني, wallahi, there's different things. يعني, late to the salat. You forgot, you said a bad word when you was upset, you did something wrong, you didn't do enough, you did too much. All, there's so many different things that happen, yeah? And so now the Shaykh, he's saying, look, that happened in the month of Rajab, which is two months before Ramadan. He said, and the same in Sha'ban. He said, so now the month of Ramadan, it's time for us, right, to perfect ourselves and try to do the best that we can in this month of Ramadan. And then it mentions a, a poem, um, inshallah. It says, Ya the Ledi Makafahu Dambu fi Rajabin, Hata Asa Rabbahu, fi Shahri Shabani, Lakad Avalla Kashahru Somi Baduhuma, O Badahuma, Fala to Sayiruhu, Aidan Shahra Isiani, Watlul Kurana was a Bihfihi Mujtahidan, Fainna who Shahru Tasbihin Wakurani, Kam Kunta Tarif. ممن صام في سلف من بين أهل وجيران وإخوان أفناهم الموت واستبقاك بعدهم حيا فما أقرب القاصي من الداني And rather than me try to translate that uh, with my non-poetic self Brother, does somebody want, maybe want to read the, uh, the translation of that? Of the poem? You want to go ahead, brother? Bismillah. Uh, uh, hold on. Oh, 
for you to lose mischief to not suffice in the Rebbe, so he continued disobeying his Lord of Shabbat, the month of Passover came to shake you afterwards. So don't make another month of disobedience, and recite the Quran and praise the Lord diligently. As it is the month of Quran and praise, how many did you know of those who passed it before, amongst family, neighbors, and siblings? Death has ended them and left you alive after them. But you are not far from the destiny. No. So it's pretty clear. I don't think I need to add anything to that. Alhamdulillah. So we go on. It says, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عن قال إذا كان أول ليلة من شهر رمضان صفدت الشياطين ومردة الجن وغلقت أبواب النار فلم يفتح منها باب وفتحت أبواب الجنة فلم يغلق منها باب وينادي مناد يا باغي الخير أقبل ويا باغي الشر أقصر ولله أتقاء من النار وذلك كل ليلة So this hadith is uh, narrated by Abu Hurairah رضي الله تعالى عن May Allah be pleased with him where he said that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said إذا كان أول ليلة من شهر رمضان And when it's the first night or if it's the first night in the month of Ramadan Right? Sufidat uh, shayateen Again, the shayateen are locked up or chained up. All right? Wa maraddatul jinn. And a certain type of jinn is chained up. Wa ghuliqat abwaabul nar. And again, similar to the hadith we already mentioned, the same thing. The Prophet ﷺ says again in this uh, hadith that the gates of the hellfire are closed. And not, and not one of them is opened. All of them are closed. And not only that, but the gates of paradise are flung open. And not one of them is locked or closed. And not only that, but there is a caller that calls out the one who wants good, then turn, come to the good. And the one who wants uh, evil, then, yani aqsir. Refrain from it. Refrain as much as you can. Stop it. Uh, and there are those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees from the hellfire every night in the month of Ramadan. Every night in the month of Ramadan, there are people who originally are destined to go to the hellfire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his mercy and from his kindness and from his love, right? For those people who do their best to take advantage of the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees them from the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are free from the hellfire. Allahumma ameen. Now, and then it says, the shaykh goes on, بَيَّنَا صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذا الحديث عددا من فضائل رمضان فيه تقييد الشياطين بالسلاسيل فلا يتوصلون إلى ما كانوا يتصلون إليه من الشر في غير رمضان غير أن هذا لا يمنع من وقوع معاس في شهر رمضان بسبب النفوس الآدمية الأمارة بالسوء So one of the points that the shaykh he makes is that look yes the shayateen are locked up and this is a question that would more than likely come up is that if the shayateen are locked up how come there's still people sinning and doing bad stuff during the month of Ramadan? How do we reconcile that? Right? And so the shaykh he, he basically says here is that that doesn't in spite of the fact that those shayateen are chained up, that doesn't stop ma'asi from happening because there are shayateen min al-ins. There, pe- there are people, men and women, who are shayateen. They're shaytan as well. And this is also mentioned in Surah An-Nas, right? Alladhi uh, waswisu fi sudur nas min al-jinnati nas There are people who are shayateen from, the jin- uh, from human beings who are just as vile and just as negative, right? And so because of that, obviously you still see um, bad and haram things going on. And another thing that's mentioned by uh, Shaykh Uthaymi, rahimahullah, is that they are not entirely, uh, completely prevented from causing harm. It's just that their influence on people and their influence in being able to uh, incite people to negativity and wrong, you know, because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the shay- the jinn, yajri fi bani adam majrid dam, that there's, uh, the shaytan runs in the blood of Adam, which obviously entails the daughters of Adam, just as their blood flows through them, 
there is a jinn or a qareen who is encouraging you and suggesting to you to do what is wrong, to do what you know is not right, huh? constantly. And then there's also an angel who is encouraging you to do what is good and what is right. And you are stuck in the middle. And it's up to you to make a choice. To do what you know you're supposed to and what you know is right. Or to listen to that suggestion. For example, it's time for salah. Fajr time. And mashallah, tabarakallah, you woke up 10 minutes before the adhan went off. And you, and you hear that little voice inside you. You got 10 minutes. Just go ahead and go to sleep for it. You know what I'm saying? And then you can wake up again. Right? When you know, you know yourself, and more than likely what's going to happen, if you just close your eyes again instead of getting up and going and making wudu, and then mashallah, you can go to fajr early, huh? what's going to happen? If you listen to that voice that said, just sleep. Just pull the covers, alhamdulillah. It's okay. You'll make it. You'll get up. But just go back to sleep. If you listen to him, that's the, that's the one sort of the shape line, right? And that's what you're caught between. You shouldn't listen to that. What should you do, Sheikh? Man, you should kick them sheets off and you should get up and go make wudu and get ready for salah. Pray the two rakah before, the, the sunnah. And then head out to the masjid. That's what you should do. Right? But that voice, it tells you to, uh, that. So that influence is, di uh, as some scholars say, it's diminished, right? That voice is diminished to a great extent. Again, decreasing the evil and the sins that happened during the month of uh, Ramadan. And then he just mentioned uh, the, the different virtues that we already said, but I want to mention a couple of them um, without going through all of them that the Sheikh is uh, mentioning here, is that the gates of paradise, or excuse me, the gates of the hellfire. Does anybody know how many gates there are to the hellfire? MashaAllah. There are seven. And how many gates to paradise? No? Eight. And something really subtle there, if you notice, there are more gates to paradise than there are gates to the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants people to go to Jannah. And again, just as Angel Jibreel alayhi salam, he alluded to that there are all these different opportunities. And of course, the month of Ramadan is one of those huge opportunities for people to go and enter through one of those doors. But it's just a matter of them making the right choice. It's a matter of them trying to the best of their ability, right? But if you notice that there are less gates to the hellfire than there are to the to paradise. And again, that's like a subtle indication of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has. Now. Another benefit that's taken from that hadith quickly is that every night someone is, or people are rather, released from the hellfire. And this is a huge huge, again, opportunity that people should be doing their utmost and trying the best that they possibly can to try to be from amongst those people. Y'all see how people are for the lottery? How much money they, they pay? Just to get that lucky chance to get, uh, to get that million dollars or that eight ball or, not the eight ball, what do you call it, the power ball? Right? How much effort do they put in it? They make sure they, go, they get in the morning, they pick their lucky number, right? They even have pools when they go to work sometimes, right? People pool their money together to buy different tickets and stuff like that. Like they, they try a lot and they spend a lot of money just for that one opportunity. We should be thinking to ourselves, how much are we doing in the month of Ramadan so we can get that opportunity to be of those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala releases from the hellfire. May Allah make us from amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Now, so tayyib, another thing that the shaykh, he goes on to say, shahru Ramadan, sababun li takfir sayyiati wa maghfirati dhunub. That the month of Ramadan is a cause for the um, covering up of sins 
sayat uh, of evil, excuse me, the covering up of evil and the wiping away of sins. فعن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عن أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الصلوات الخمس والجمعة إلى جمعة ورمضان إلى رمضان مكفرات ما بينهن إذا اجتن إذا اجتنب الكبائر. So again, الله brothers and sisters, one of the wonderful and beautiful things about this religion is that day and night, and you're going to hear me say this throughout this workshop, opportunities. Allah gives us so many opportunities in our life, day and night, to gain his reward, to gain his love and his pleasure. Here the Prophet Sallallahu mentions in hadith narrated by Abu Huraira that the five daily prayers, okay? The five daily prayers, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. And then from Jumu'ah, from Friday to Friday, and from Ramadan ila Ramadan, all of those are mukaffirat ma baynahun. So you pray Fajr, and you prayed it. You made wudu properly, and you prayed it properly in its time. And you reached Dhuhr, and you made wudu, or if you kept your wudu from Fajr, and you prayed it properly in its time. In between that, just you staying alive, just you being alive and making it, which who allows you to live in the first place? Who allows you to live, Shaykh? Allah allows you to live. Just you making it from salat to salat and what's in between there, Allah forgives you. And then from Jumu'ah ila Jumu'ah, from the Friday to the Friday, just live. Just make it through, brother. Just make it through, sister. Make sure you pray your five. And just make it from Jumu'ah to Jumu'ah and all the stuff that you did in between, it's going to be forgiven. Mukaffirat. Not only that, then from Ramadan ila Ramadan, which is, a, which is what? The entire year. Again, it's a doing away of your sins so long, so long as you stay away from the major sins. That's why I said when you're traversing on that path, it's going to happen. It's gonna get, you're going to get some dust on you. Some sin, there's going to be something. Something's going to happen. Right? And so when that happens, so it's natural as human beings, كما قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في سنن أبي داود كل بني آدم خطاء وخير الخطائين التوابون All of the sons of Adam, which of course means all of the daughters of Adam as well, all make mistakes. But the best of them are the ones who are constantly returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is expecting you and me to make mistakes. That's why He's given us these constant opportunities from every that's every day He's given you opportunity. Then every week He's given you an opportunity. Then it's every year there's an opportunity. All you gotta do is just make it. All you gotta do is just make it. And it's mukafirat al dhunub. And you just gotta stay away from major sins. And some examples of major sins are zina, fornication, right? If, you're, if you have a spouse and to go outside of that and have extramarital relations, not taking care of your parents, uquq al this is known to be from the kabair. It's placed in the same realm and categories of shirk. Which is the greatest sin that you could possibly do. When they talk about the kabair, the major sins, Uquq al-Walidayn is one of the first ones that are mentioned. Disrespecting your parents and not taking care of your parents. So if you happen to be doing that, but you're praying your five daily prayers, you're not getting that same benefit. You're, not, you're missing out on the opportunity. Now, um, but yes, it seemed like you had a question, brother. When you make kabair, those sins, it is obligatory to make tawbah from them. And it would seem to be indicated from this hadith, Haqi, that it's definitely getting in the way of that, that huge reward from Allah, just you making it from prayer to prayer. 
Because you got this big thing hanging over you. So you got to, I mean, that's what's indicated from the hadith. Because it says, so long as you stay away from the kaba'ir, which means what? That if you don't stay away from the kaba'ir, then you got a problem from, you're not, you're not part of this reward. But anyways, but from the kaba'ir, it, 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 it needs to be noted that those you have to make toba from. And those have conditions and um, things that have to be fulfilled in order for it to be uh, forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, no? That's how long it's been? Tayyip, alhamdulillah. Technically making good time. And then another thing that the, uh, another hadith the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Masama Ramadan Iman and Wahtisab and Rufi Lahu Matakadam in Dambi. Woman Kama Ramadan Iman and Wahtisab and Rufi Lahu Matakadam in Dambi. Woman Kama Layla Til Kadri Iman and Wahtisab and Rufi Lahu Matakadam in Dambi Rawah al Bukhari. And just something quick to note too. I don't know if y'all noticed, almost every hadith we're going through, Abu Huraira radiallahu an. May Allah be pleased with him. He's the one who's narrating the hadith. Right? He's known as one of the people who narrated a massive amount of hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if I'm not mistaken, it's over 5,000 hadith that he mentioned from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's just a side note. But anyways, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, iman, with faith and conviction, faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, faith in the Day of Judgment, they have faith. وَحْتِسَابٍ And they are hoping for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're counting that the reward is going to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمْ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Then he'll be forgiven for his sins. He'll be forgiven for his sins. And whoever stands up, meaning prays in the month of Ramadan, prays Salat al-Taraweeh, and prays the, uh, obviously the five daily prayers, but especially the Salat al-Taraweeh, if they do that, same thing with iman, with faith, and they're hoping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's going to reward them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them what has been, uh, what has, uh, uh, been passed from sins. وَمَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ And the same, whoever stands on the night of Laylatul Qadr, whoever stands on that night, again with faith, and with their hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's going to reward them and compensate them, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them for their sins. Again, if you see just constantly, over and over and over again, it's opportunity after opportunity for us. And the other thing too is if you notice is the variety, the variety in those opportunities. Standing up in prayer for a long time may not be your thing. Obviously, in the month of Ramadan, you should be doing as much as you can. But that might be a little bit more difficult on you. Reading a lot of Quran, your work might not even allow you to. You might not have the time because of work. Right? I was talking to a brother the other day, and he was saying how he was already making plans for his Ramadan and how he wanted it to be situated and everything. And then, subhanAllah, things at his work changed, where now he's going to be working at night, and most of his nights he'll be spent uh, working. Right? So he's like... So he asked, does that mean my Ramadan is worthless? No. There are other things that he does. Look, just him fasting, right? Man sama Ramadan, iman and wahtisabit. Him fasting with conviction and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope in his reward, then he will still have that opportunity that the people who fasted and the people who stood up in prayer and the people, right, who took advantage of those other opportunities, he's got the same opportunity for, the, for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Naam. And then عن عبد الله ابن عمر رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الصيام والقرآن يشفعان للعبد يوم القيامة يقول الصيام أي ربي منعته الطعام والشهوات بالنهار فشفعني فيه ويقول القرآن منعته النوم بالليل فشفعني فيه قال فيشفعان رواه إمام أحمد So now something to note about the day of judgment and our deeds is that on the Day of Judgment, there will be a scale, literally a, a scale with two balances, right? Where you put things on to weigh. 
and our deeds will be weighed. Your good deeds and your bad deeds, they're going to be weighed. And that's most, what most of us know, and that's most of what we hear. But also, in some ways, your deeds, the deeds themselves, will come on your behalf and actually speak and intercede on your behalf. And this is from the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that this will happen. How that will happen exactly? Will they be in the form or shape of a man? Allahu Alam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu he says here that the Quran, fasting, your, your action of fasting, and you reading the Quran will come and speak on your behalf. And, it's, and the Siyam is going to say, Oh Allah, please, your servant, I prevented him from eating and drinking during the day. Please accept my intercession on his behalf. And then the Quran is going to say, uh, please accept my intercession on his behalf. And then the Quran is going to say, oh Allah, I prevented your servant, right, from, uh, at night from sleeping because he was busy praying at night. So he says, so accept my intercession on his behalf. But if you notice here is what you fasting in the month of Ramadan is going to be an intercession for you and I on the day of judgment. That it's going to come and it's going to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speak on our behalf. And we have to understand that what is mentioned, right, is that what benefits you in the afterlife? Shaykh, does money benefit you in the afterlife? It doesn't. Money, cars, wealth, fame, for none of that benefits you in your Qiyamah. Good deeds are what benefit you. Good deeds are what benefit us. Right? And of course, Sadaqah Jariyah, right? But of course, Sadaqah Jariyah is a good deed. Right? It just so happens to be more of an investment of a good deed. Where like you invest, you build an Islamic school, and kids are learning in that school. And then while they're learning, even after you pass, you still... Getting it, but it's still something you did, a good deed that you did, and that deed was more like a, an investment and a catalyst for other good things to happen. Does that make sense? So basically, only good deeds benefit you in Yom al Qiyamah. Even the son, a good waladun salih, a righteous son or a righteous daughter, right, if they make dua for you. But how are they going to make dua for you? If you raise them right. Again, your good actions, because you raised them right. You taught them, look, you need to pray to Allah, belief in Allah. He's your Lord. He's your God. And look, I'm telling you, and you raise them right. You feed them. You take care of them. You show them how to be a man, or you show them how to be a righteous woman. And then when they grow up, they remember you. They make a dua because of your actions, what you did. Right? So either way, only your righteous actions benefit you on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And in some instances, they come and they speak on your behalf. And this is what this hadith is teaching us. Now, so now, the last thing in this chapter, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and again, عَنَا بِهُرَيْرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُ عَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ كُلُّ عَمِلِ ابْنِ آدَمْ يُضَاعَفُ الْحَسَنَةُ عَشَرُ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَى سَبْعِ مِئَةِ ضِعْفِ قال الله عز وجل كل أمل ابن آدم له إلا الصيام فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به والصيام جنة فإذا كان يوم صوم أحدكم فلا يرفث نعم فلا يرفث يومئذ ولا يسخب فإن سابه أحد أو قاتله فليقل إني إني امرؤ إني امرؤ صائم والذي نفسي نفس محمد بيده لخلوف فم oh that's another hadith so anyways so here the prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said in a hadith قدسي meaning that the Allah سبحانه وتعالى said that all of the actions of the sons of Adam which of course is also the daughters of Adams are multiplied الحسنة عشر أمثالها that a good deed is multiplied all the way up to 10. It can be multiplied 10 times. Ila Up to 700 times. 
And what we should note from this hadith, brothers and sisters, is that, again, the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is al-jawad and al-kareem, that he is the most generous and the most giving, is that someone who's generous, they always compensate you more than what you deserve. Someone who's generous, they always compensate you more than you deserve. And if you see here, automatically, by default, Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, one good deed automatically is, is getting 10. You only did one. You only deserve to be compensated for one. And that would be fair and that would be just. But because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is al kareem because he's al-jawad, because he's generous, he compensates us and gives us more than what we could ever do and more than what we could ever deserve. And on that note, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that no person will get on to paradise on their own merit, yani from your actions. And they asked him, Wala anta ya Rasulullah? They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Wala ana, illa an yatagammadani Allahu bi rahmatihi. He said, not even me, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enshrouds me in his mercy. That's how you're going to get to paradise. And this, is, and this is an expression of that, that when you do one deed, you're getting compensated 10 all the way to 700. So you really, you can't do enough. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he keeps giving you more and more and more than what you're really doing. Because what? Because he's merciful, because he's kind, because he's generous, because he wants you to go to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to go to his jannah. Allahumma ameen. And not only that, Allah, uh, the Prophet went on and uh, said uh, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that all of the actions of Adam are for him except for fasting. He said all of the actions, the good deeds that you do, you're going to be compensated. Right? But this siyam, this fasting, this one is special. This is unique. And that one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that one's for me. He said, فَإِنَّهُ لِي That one's for me. وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ And I will reward, reward them accordingly. And something that is beautiful here, brothers and sisters, if we said that Allah is al-jawad and al-kareem, that he's generous and giving, and he gives more than we deserve, and he doesn't mention how much he's going to give you. What does that indicate to you? It's that it's big? What does that mean to you, Nabil? That Allah doesn't mention the reward, huh? Tremendous reward. That it's so, it's so tremendous that it's what? Say that again. It's unimaginable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even want to mention it because it's, it's so much. But don't worry because Allah is generous. Know that you are going to be compensated more than you could ever imagine. Just make sure that you fast. Just make sure that you fast in month of Ramadan. Subhanallah. I'll tell you. Um, and then he goes on to say, فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلَا يَرْفُثْ And if there's a day in the fasting, um, don't. Yarfuth, which means like to speak ill or say bad things. Yoma idin wala yaskhab. Fa in sabahu. And if anybody were to curse you or to try to fight you, then you tell them, look, I'm a fasting person. I'm fasting right now. Look, don't. don't. If somebody tries to curse you, somebody tries to harm you at work or in school or whatever, just let it go. كما قال الله سبحانه وتعالى وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا قالوا سلام and when ignorant people address them they don't respond in kind somebody curse at you and you curse at them somebody yell at you and you yell at them you be calm cool and collected which is a lot easier to do when you're hungry and thirsty anyways <laughs> alhamdulillah it's a lot easier to do when you're hungry and thirsty it's hard it's hard to be you know what I'm saying to have a lot of energy anyways but Allah, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi reminded us that you should be calm and cool at that time. And you speak to them words of peace when they address you. 
because you have a greater objective. Basically, when somebody's coming at you like that, we said what? That opportunity, they're basically trying to get in the way of your opportunity. You're trying to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they're trying to step in front of that. And you're like, nah, 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 it's, it's all good. I'm going to just go around you because I'm trying to get to that opportunity. And me getting back at you or me showing you that I could whoop you if I wanted to or me cursing you just as bad as you cursing me, that's not as important to me as that opportunity right now. That's what's more important to me. And the beautiful thing about it is, ayyuhal الْإِخْوَ akhawat. the beautiful thing about it is, brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, ما زاد عبدا عفوا إلا زاده الله عزا ومن تواضع لله رفعه الله that a slave doesn't a servant doesn't increase in in forgiveness in pardoning people except that Allah subhanahu wa taala honors that individual Allah raises them in honor and nobody humbles themselves. Oh, كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, and nobody humbles themselves except that Allah subhanahu wa taala raises that person. So again, in the month of Ramadan, if somebody's cursing you or fighting you or whatever, see, because the way we think about things, like if somebody was to disrespect you or harm you or come at you, you're supposed to do what? Our, our makeup, <clears throat> and you know what I'm talking about, Yusuf. Our makeup is what? You got to return that. Can't nobody disrespect me. Can't nobody talk to me like that. Don't put his hands on me. Who do you think I am? You have, that's our instinct. And we think that when pe people are humble, when people are calm, or people are cool, we ought, for some reason we translate that as weakness. But that's not really the, really the case. And I'm gonna give y'all one example. I knew a brother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. He was an Aikido instructor. You remember him? You remember Sensei Abdurrahman? Achi, this man was a warrior in every sense of the word. Achi, he, Allahu alam how many ways he can kill you with his bare hands. Wallahi, achi, he had a black belt in Kung Fu. He was a black belt in Aikido. What else was he a black belt in? Filipino stick fighting. Achi, he has so many different things. But I remember him telling us a, telling a story. Or excuse me, a student of his was telling us a story about him. That he was near Masjid al-Nabawi with some of his... Disciples, some of his students who were studying Aikido under him. And, some, and there was a small little incident or accident with cars. And subhanAllah, the person got out the car, the one who the accident with, and the sensei, Abdurrahman, he got out the car. And this person was slim, we'll say like scrawny, you know what I'm saying? And went up to him and was yelling at the sensei. Not only did, they, did he do that, was he yelling at him? Sensei didn't say nothing. He was just cool, calm. And then the dude spit in his face. He spit in his face. Now, I bear witness, I swear by Allah, he could have killed that man with his bare hands. If he wanted to. And he just did just like this. Just like this. And he was just like, sorry. Got back in his car and left. All of his students, they wanted, to, they wanted to hurt that man. And he stopped his students and was like, no, leave him alone. Leave him be. Leave him be. Right? He can if he want to. But, you, but if, you see, if you observe that, what would you think? And he's not but like 5'6", maybe 5'7", maybe if he's wearing some tennis shoes, the, the sensei. He, he seems like a small stature, small framed man. If you were observing that and you saw somebody yelling at somebody, then spitting in their face, and they don't say nothing, what would you interpret that to me? You'd be like, that dude's scared. He let him talk to him like that and do that to him. But our values are different. Our values, the way that the Prophet Muhammad taught us, the way the deen of Islam teaches us. Now, it doesn't mean that you just, I'm not, now, the reason I'm telling you that doesn't mean like let people go and spit in your face. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that he could have done something to him if he wanted to. But, that had, but the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever has that forbearance and forgiveness and pardons people, who has more right to pardon someone? 
and forgive someone who has more right than anyone else is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on Yom Al-Qiyamah, people who pardon people and forgive people, Allah loves those people. And when they do that, right? And, the, and كَمَا قَالَ عَيْشِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا الْأَجْرُ مِنْ جِنْسِ الْعَمَلِ That the reward that you get is from the, the, the nature or the, the type of action that you do. So him being pardoned and forgiving, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to pardon and forgive an individual on Yom Al-Qiyamah when they're forgiving and pardoning. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us to do. This is what Siyam is teaching us that we should do. That pardon people, forgive people. Overlook their mistakes and their shortcomings. Overlook if they're trying to argue with you. If your spouse might be arguing with you, you might be 100% right in the month of Ramadan. Allah, you said, man. Just forgive her. Just pardon her. It might be your brother, Ahi, your younger brother, who he used to beat up all the time when y'all was kids. And now he's, you're arguing with him. Or he wants to argue with you in the month of Ramadan. Just forgive him, Ahi. Even if you were right. Just let it go. It's not the end of the world. It's not the most important thing. Ain't nobody really watching there anyways. It's not like you guys going to prove. Who are you going to prove? I can, I'm, bad, I'm stronger than my brother. You're going to prove to your wife. I'm, I'm the man of the house. Who are we really trying to impress and prove to? It's to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Now, um, now, Now the Prophet, and then the Prophet Muhammad, the last couple of Allahumma uh, salli Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. والذي نفس والذي نفس محمد بيده لخلوف فم صائم أطيب عند الله يوم القيامة من ريح المسك. In this hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that the smell or the scent that we have, which we would consider a bad smell, right? When you fast in, and it's basically where that bad smell is coming from, is because your stomach is empty, and so the smell is emanating from your stomach. To your mouth, right? That smell is more uh, fragrant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment than the smell of misk, which is like a beautiful smell. It's a wonderful smell. And it's better than that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because where is that, where is that smell emanating from anyways? It's from you giving up uh, halal things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you love Allah. Tayyib. And then, وَلِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَانِ يَفْرَحُهُمَا إِذَا أَفْطَرَ فَرِحَ بِفِطْرِهِ وَإِذَا لَقِيَ رَبَّهُ فَرِحَ بِصَوْمِهِ The Prophet ﷺ mentions here that there are two times when the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy. The one who's fasting. When he breaks his fast, because of course when you're thirsty and hungry and you finally get to break your fast, Alhamdulillah. And then also when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be even more happy at that point. But there are two happinesses that that person receives. Right? And then lastly, وَعَنْ سَهَلِ بْنِ سَعَدْ رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن في الجنة بابا يقال له الريان يدخل منه الصائمون يوم القيامة لا يدخل منه أحد غيرهم يقال أين الصائمون فيقومون لا يدخل منه أحد غيرهم فإذا, فإذا دخلوا أغلق فلم يدخل منه أحد and uh, we'll finish lastly here that there is a door to paradise that is called a rayyan And that door is specially and uniquely for those who fast. Those who fast. And the scholars say those who fast in the month of Ramadan. And that door on the day of judgment will be opened. And those people who are known to fast... Meaning that they didn't just fast one Ramadan and then the next Ramadan they didn't because they didn't feel like it. Or next time they didn't fast and then sometimes they did. No, no, no. The people who fast as the way they should to the best of their ability, they will be called to come to that door. And nobody else except for those people who used to fast will be able to go into that door. And then once all of them have entered, that door will close and no one else will be able to enter that door. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and allow us to be able to enter to that door. Allahumma ameen. No. And so the next chapter, inshallah, but before I go on, are there any questions up until this point? 
Are there any questions up to this point? No? Good, alhamdulillah, sister. We got three, okay, mashallah. Yes. Did you say, is it all of the shayateen that are, that are locked up? Now, there are some scholars that say it's all of the shayateen and some that say that it's just the ones that's mentioned in that hadith, maraddatul uh, jinn, which is a certain type of shaytan that's locked up. Um, but at any rate, Allahu a'lam if every last single one of them is. But nonetheless, they are locked, uh, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned here, that uh, the shayateen are uh, locked up, especially the maraddatul uh, jinn. But if all of them are, um, I'm, I'm not sure. As I said, because some scholars say that, no, it's not all of them. It's just the, what do you call it? The, um, the minor ones. Wallahu a'lam. Now, uh, no, some here, here, and then there. Now, yes, sir. No. Not all of the jinn are shayateen. Because we said they're shayateen, which are like devils, from men and from the jinn. But there are jinn who are not shayateen, that they're, they're Muslims, they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they pray. Those are not shayateen. The shayateen are not exclusively jinn. Some jinns, or excuse me, shayateen can be from the jinn, but not all jinns are shayateen. Yes. So shayateen can be jinns, and shayateen can be human beings. And I'm sure you've come across them. There's some bad people out there, brother. There's some bad people. And those people who do terrible things, mass murderers, right? Serial killers. Them is shayateen, achi. People who, you know what I'm saying? Hitler, dare I say, probably a shaitan. Stalin, Allahu A'lam, but probably a shaitan. Min al ins. Right? Uh, now. The rebellious jinn. That's why we said, what I said, yeah, muraddatu jinn, a certain type of jinn. But Allah Allah Shayateen are locked up. Some Shayateen are jinn. Some of them are men. Beyond that, why was that one specifically? I, I don't know, brother. Inshallah, no. But we, Inshallah. We'll try to look that up, inshallah. No. I just wanted to ask, I don't know exactly what, what, what it was. Why is it from the name mentioned? Are we supposed to say it out loud or not? Like loud enough for yourself to hear, Akhi. Loud enough for yourself to hear. No. Like if you were praying by yourself, Maghrib, if you happen to be praying by yourself, right? You don't, you don't need to pray for the whole room to hear. Pray quietly enough for yourself to hear, right? So basically, like you whisper it to yourself, right? Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like that. Alhamdulillah, wallahu a'lam. Now, question regarding the hadith talking about the multiplication between the seven hundred times the hadith. Yeah. The indication is that it's forbidden. Is that the inverse then also to be considered, or in Arabic is that specified? Not always. Sometimes, yes. So, for example. Places that are special and times that are special, then sins can be multiplied. Under normal, regular circumstances, outside of the month of Ramadan, for example, 
under normal circumstances, one sin equals one sin. But in special times and in special places, the sanctity of those places and the sanctity of those times, so not only in the month of Ramadan, so the, 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 in Muharram, for example, in the days of um, in the Muharram and Ashura for those type of days, in those times, because of the sanctity of those times, to sin in those times, the sins are multiplied. Or to sin in Mecca or in Medina, also those places, because of the sanctity of those places, sins can, uh, they are multiplied. No. But outside of that, so outside of the month of Ramadan, sin would be uh, one. No. Allah. No. And this will be the last one, inshallah. Uh, I'm sorry. Unless the sisters have a question. Because there's only one so far. No? Okay. No, okay. I'll tell you. Bismillah. That we are all destined to go to paradise? No. It sounded like he said all of mankind, not just Muslim. He said all of mankind, that everybody. No. So is that a statement or a question? If that's accurate, that all of mankind is destined to go to paradise, kind of like your teacher saying everybody has an A in class and you just got to keep that A? Is that kind of like that? I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, tell you. Then what's the other question? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it says Utaqa, yeah? The hadith? Utaqa min al that's plural. So not person, but people. People? Yes. Okay. Now. So, the, the, these individuals that ever have the ability to go back, they, that, the deeds, they shift back, and they fluctuate. They Allahu Akbar. Would Allah be freeing them from the hellfire if they were going to go back? Of course, he knows everything. But I'm asking you, if he said he's freed them and released them from the hellfire, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know the future? Does he know everything that's going to happen, how it would happen? And even if it didn't happen, but were it to happen, how it would happen? He knows everything, right? Okay, so if he released somebody from the hellfire... Does it seem likely that they would go back? No. No. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala released them from the hell. So for, for example, uh, now of course you can't point to an individual. We don't, we don't know who those people are. So it's not like you're going to see like, oh, you were one of the people who were released from the hellfire and you messed up that opportunity, you bonehead. Like, we, don't, we won't know, right? That's Allah Allah. Right? On that, in that instance. But there are like indications of things. So for example, somebody who makes hajj, right? And when they make hajj, or after making hajj, excuse me, they, they change their ways. Right? Maybe they were sinning or doing certain things before. Now again, we can't point at that individual, right? And say, he's, he's going to the paradise. But the scholars, they say that that's an indication Right? Because now he's changed. Like he, when he made hajj and he starts doing things differently is an indication of his hajj being accepted. Or fasting in the month of Ramadan. When you fast in Ramadan, right? And let's say, for example, you had certain bad habits and you left them off in the month of Ramadan. And not only that, you didn't like, as soon as the month of Ramadan was done, you start picking up those bad habits again. But you left off those bad habits. Again, it's an indication 
right? No? That that person as, um, that their Ramadan, excuse me, was accepted. So now in this, in this thing here, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has released somebody from the hellfire, then they're not going to and he go back. Wallahu a'lam. That's, that, that's what that would be. It's an indication that that person is, is changed or has done. They're doing something right. And they're going to continue to do so because Allah released them from the hellfire. Otherwise, uh, it would diminish from the virtue of this hadith for the mere fact that Allah is even going to release them from the hellfire. The fact that they're just going to go back anyways. Or that they're potentially going to go back. Oh, no. Uh, no. Right? The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written everything in lawh al-mahfuz, and there are people who are destined for the hellfire, and there are people who are destined for paradise. None of us know who th is going where, except for those few people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentioned in the Quran or in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, but beyond that, no one knows where they're destined to go. So uh, everyone is supposed to work uh, to, to the best of their ability to get to their home. But no, everyone is not destined to paradise. Everybody is destined to a place, right? And they're basically living life and traversing it to get to that place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all destined to go to Jannah to Firdaus and A'la. Allahumma ameen. So now, if that's the... So inshallah, I'm going to pick up the pace here a little bit, inshallah. Try to finish before Maghrib, inshallah ta'ala. So the next thing we're going to cover are from the wisdoms, or the wisdom behind fasting. And the Sheikh he mentions a number of different things that are from the wisdom of fasting, right? Um, and this is something that we should be thinking about and considering because you're spending what, 15 hours, 16, 17 hours, depriving yourself of food, depriving yourself of drink, depriving yourself of physical intimacy if you're married, for what? What, is, what do we get out of that? What is the, excuse me, not what do we get out of it, but rather what is the deeper wisdom behind you doing that, you and I doing that? And why do Muslims for 1400 years continue to do this? What do they get out of it, right? And so that's what this, uh, this chapter is talking about. So anyways, يقول الشيخ إن الله سبحانه وتعالى هو الحكيم لا يشرع لإباده تشريعا إلا وفيه حكم بالغة تعود عليهم بالسعادة في الدنيا والآخرة علمها من من علمها وجاهلها من جهل جاهلها من جهلة وقد شرع سبحانه وتعالى لعباده صوم شهر رمضان لحكم عظيمة أو لحكم عظيمة منها. So the Sheikh he says Allah سبحانه وتعالى one of his names is that he is Al Hakim that he is the most wise that he is the most wise and everything that he does that he legislates for his servants is for a deep and tremendous wisdom. It's for a deep and tremendous wisdom. And not only that, it is for their happiness, both in, yani for our happiness, both in this life and in the next. And for fasting the month of Ramadan, there is also tremendous wisdom in that specifically. From them is that Psalm Tazkiyatun Lil Nafs wa ilaj laha min batr wal ashar. Fasting is a purification of our souls. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, فَأَمَّا فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَ النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in regards to purification of the soul that the one who allows his soul to transgress dunya, and they prefer the life of this world, الْمَأْوَى then certainly the hellfire is their ultimate abode and where they're going to be going. And whoever fears standing in front of his Lord 
and prevents his soul or his ego, excuse me, and his nafs, his desire, his or her desires, عن الهوى, on whatever it wants. فإن الجنة هي المأوى. Then ultimately, their abode is going to be paradise. That's where they're going. And so basically, the month of Ramadan, this month of fasting, is supposed to be us preventing ourselves from things that are typically halal. That are typically halal that you want. Water, food, uh, I don't know. Whatever halal foods, orange juice, coffee, right? All these different things that you eat, biryani, hila, all of that stuff, right? You prevent yourself from that. Bariz, pasto, right? All these things, they're normally halal for you. You like them, you love them, and they're permissible for you. But you prevent yourself, you stop yourself. Basically, you self-discipline. You have, through self-discipline, right? You are purifying yourself. And basically, you're taking control of your desires is really what it is. Instead of letting your desires control you, by you intentionally, willfully stopping yourself from things that you can normally do, you are taking control of your desires. And so instead of them like, whenever I'm hungry, I just eat, or you ever heard somebody say like, I'm an emotional eater or something like that, instead of your desires doing it, like no, because you self-disciplined, you're, you disciplined yourself, right? Because, Shay, who's watching you when you fasting? Is there somebody, fasting police? Is there fasting police, Shay? Is somebody watching? Who's, who's forcing themselves to fast? You are, right? Nobody's making you do that. You're doing it yourself. So you, in, in Ramadan, you're taking control of your desires and basically purifying it so that it's not controlling you. That's basically what that is. That's what tazkiyat to nafs is. And when you do that, and you do that because you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and standing in front of him, the one who, because their fear of Allah, that they prevent themselves from doing that, yani fulfilling their desires, then their abode is paradise. Now, فَبِالسِّيَامِ يَمْلِكُ الْمُسْلِمْ زَمَامَ نَفْسَهُ وَيَقُودُهَا إِلَى مَا فِيهِ خَيْرُهَا وَسَعَادَتَهَا وَيَتَعَوَّدُ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُطْلَقُ لِنَفْسِهِ and he basically just reiterated what, or he said what I just, what I just said, is that basically you have discipline over yourself. And you, instead of letting your desires basically lead you to the hellfire, you basically like, nah, nah, get in line, get in line. We're, we're go, this is, that's not where we're going. This is what we're going to do. And you basically take control. Now, and so another thing is that and so now, when you're fasting, it actually constricts your veins. And I, uh, because the shaitan, as the Prophet ﷺ mentions here, in the shaitan, that shaitan is basically running through your veins. He's basically running through your veins. As the Prophet Sallallahu said here in this hadith. And this, hadith. and this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. So now when your veins are restricted, right, he can't move about as easily. And that's what we mean by their suggestions, their negative suggestions are diminished. Now, طيب. فَسَيَكُونُ الصِّيَامُ وَسَاوِسَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَتَنْكَسِرُ حِدَّةُ الشَّهْوَةِ وَالْغَضَبِ فَلَا يَجِدُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَدْخَلًا يَدْخُلُ مِنْهُ إِلَى قَلْبِ الْمُؤْمِنِ بِالْإِضَافَةِ إِلَى تَصْفِيدِ الشَّيَاطِينِ بِالسَّلَاسِلِ فِي رَمَضَانِ فَإِذَا جَرِبَ الْمُسْلِمْ حَلَاوَةُ الصِّلَةِ بِالرَّحْمَانِ وَالْبُعْدِ عَنِ التَّزَيُّنِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهُ سَيَحْرِسُ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ بَعْدَ رَمَضَانِ عَلَى أَنْ يَكُونَ مِنْ مِنْ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الْمُخْلِصِينَ الَّذِينَ لَيْسَ لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانٌ so he says, basically, if a person, right, is able to, t um, that those suggestions are diminished, the waswasa of the shaitan is diminished, right? And not only that, you take control of your desires, your anger is diminished, like, and I'm sure we all know this, right? When you're hungry and thirsty, it's hard to be angry at somebody, right? He says, when all of that is diminished, then basically, because one of the ways that shaitan can come to a person, 
There are one, two ways that shaitan can come to a person. Well, actually, there's more than that, but two specifically is when someone is extremely angry, shaitan has an opening to a person when they're extremely angry. And that's when you see people do things that they regret. Things that they would say, they even think to themselves, like, who was I? I would never do that under normal circumstances. It's shaitan has a huge madkhal, has a huge doorway to you when you're, when you're extremely angry and also when you're extremely happy. Right? When you get, oh, when you get carried away and you can, you can have a tendency to become careless when you're, when you're really, really happy. Right? So in both times, you know, the Muslim, their personality, they should never go to one, one extreme or the other. Because, and especially if you think about it, if you get so elated and so happy about something, right? What if that thing's not there? Or if it goes away, then you're going to get extremely sad. But at any rate, it's a doorway for the shaitan. And so he's saying all of this is diminished. And what happens is basically is that now you get away from the whispering of the shaitan and him beautifying this worldly life, right? From his whispering. And when you start to protect yourself from that and getting used to having a connection and tasting the sweetness of being uh, connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Then the hopes is that that will carry on after the month of Ramadan. That it's going to carry on after the month of Ramadan. And not only that, but shaitan is not going to have, when that happens, you become from those who are the mukhlisin, those who are the sincere servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and shaitan has no power over you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلِصِينَ And this is actually a statement of the shaitan, subhanallah, نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْهُمْ He says, subhanallah, he says by your honor, talking to Allah, he says by your honor, O oh Allah, لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ I'm going to make them all go astray. Ajma'in. I'm going to lead all of them astray and distract them and take them off the path. Except for those of your servants who are sincere. And again, shaitan is an opportunity to become of those who are sincere. And when you do, shaitan has no way to get to you. Right? Because he says, I'm going to try to get all of them. I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to get all of them except for those who are sincere servants to you. He knows he has no way to them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith, uh, or the Prophet sallallahu wa said that Allah said in a hadith Qudsi, Man adali waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb. That whoever harms one of my servants, and of course those are the mukhlisin, one of those who are my close allies and servants, la adhantuhu bil harb. And I have, Allah has declared war on behalf of that person to whoever harms him. So shaitan has no way to that person. And then another thing from the, from the wisdom behind the fasting of Ramadan, as-sawm takhliyatun lil-qalb min ash-shawaghil al-dunyawiyya wa i'anatu lahu ala tadhakkur wa tafakkur. And so fasting is also a way of cleaning out your heart and freeing it from any type of worldly um, distractions and it helps one to develop uh, like reflection and it helps to strengthen that in a person because when you fill up when you eat your fill which I'm sure some of y'all have right you ever eat until you're full and you get the you get the itis you just get so full you want to get you almost get like sleepy Okay, you don't have to tell me, no problem, but I know you have. I'm sure you have at some point in time. Come on, I know you had some good food before and you're just like, oh, and you didn't stop yourself. And then after later, you regretted it. But what happens afterwards? You get all sluggish, you get tired, you're saying you get sleep, you can't, you don't think the same, right? And actually, physically, what's going on is basically blood is coming down from your brain and rushing down to your stomach to, to digest that food. That's what's really going on. Right? And into your intestines to process all that food. And so now that's what's happened. So fasting, right, it takes that away. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said, مَا مَلَأَ إِبْنُ آدَمْ وِعَاءً شَرًّا مِنْ بَطْنٍ حَسُبِ إِبْنِ آدَمْ أُكُلَاتٌ 
يقمن صلبه فإن كان له لا محالة فثلث طعام وثلث شراب وثلث لنفس لنفسه. So the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that look at the worst thing that the son of Adam has ever filled up is his stomach. That's the worst thing he ever filled up. Meaning that you should never do, you should never eat until you just like, woo, I got to loosen my belt. You know what I'm saying? Put on some sweatpants and now you should never do, you should never eat that much. Were you so full? And you know what it, you know what happens though, right? In the month of Ramadan, that's what a lot of people do. They fast and, and you know the crazy thing is, is actually what's happening is your stomach starts to shrink because it needs less food. When you fast like that, your stomach shrinks, right? So it's like a normal size that it should be, which is about the size of a, of a fist, of an adult fist for adults. But what happens is in Ramadan, because you, you know what I'm saying, your eyes are bigger than your stomach and you've been fasting all day, you get to there and you just eat everything. And then instead of it getting smaller, right, where you don't need more food, you stretch out your stomach. And the Prophet sent him, he said, look, it would be enough for a person, really, a few bites to straighten your back. Really, if that's, if, if you have, when you eat, that's really all you need is a few, a few morsels, a few bites to straighten your back. Meaning so you're not like bending up because you're hungry and you're starving. He was like, that would be enough. But he said, la mahala, but if you got to eat some more, all right, no problem. Then leave a third for drink, uh, food, a third for drink, and a third so you can breathe. So, but at the end of the day, you still what? You still don't fill up your stomach. And when you think about it, when you come to, for Salat to Taraweeh, it's, it, you know, I'm sure some of y'all have experienced it, how difficult it is when your stomach's all full and you gotta, you about to be standing for like an hour. You're sleepy, it's hard to sleep. You just want to lay down and just be like, man, instead of thinking about what the Imam and the Sheikh is saying, you're just like, man, when is he going to finish? SubhanAllah, this is taking so long and... Allah Akbar, man. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he's saying here what? A third for food, a third for a drink, and a third for air. But you should never fill up your stomach. Um, and what that helps, and that helps in you being able to, to, re, be, uh, to reflect and to think, and especially when you're doing your salawat, when you're praying, and when you're doing the different acts of ibadah. And then, Asawm ibadatun yataqarrabu fiha al-abdu ila rabbihi. And fasting is one of the greatest acts uh, acts of worship that you can do to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially in the month of Ramadan kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam also in a hadith qudsi when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ma taqarraba ilayya 'abdi bi shay'in ahabba ilay mimma iftaradtu alay and a servant doesn't draw closer or near to me by uh, except by those things that i have made obligatory on uh, my servant doesn't draw closer to me or nearer to me by those things that are more beloved to me than the things that I have made as an obligation on him. There is nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the Ramadan. You could fast for the rest of your life until you die, Mondays and Thursdays, right? And all of the ayam al bid or known as the white nights, 13, 14, and 15 of the lunar calendar. And all of Sha'ban and all the days of Shawad, none of them are equal to fasting the month of Ramadan, one month of Ramadan. That is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he loves it so much, he made it an obligation on you. So it's not even up to you. If you're really a servant of Allah, Allah loves this more than anything and if you're gonna listen to me, I made this an obligation on you. That's how much I love it. And you're not gonna draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with more so than with something that he's made as an obligation. And Ramadan is one of those things that, again, it's an opportunity to get near and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As-Sawm sababun li taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O oh, you who believe fasting has been prescribed for you and written for you, just like it was written and prescribed for the people that came before you, in hopes that you may become God-fearing people, in hopes that you may develop taqwa. Fasting is one of the most potent and powerful ways to develop taqwa. It is something that is so needed. Even outside of the month of Ramadan, especially those, uh, those uh, people who are young, they're not able to get married, 
fasting. It may sound like, I mean, I've had brothers come to me and be like, I'm, not, I'm, uh, I, I'm trying to get married, but I can't get married, or it's been a long time, what should I do? It may sound simplistic, but like fast, brother, but it is such a huge, huge and powerful tool to control your desires because it, it diminishes, right, the, your desires. And not only that, it develops in a person self-discipline. It helps you to lower your gaze, especially for now, for us, look at in the month of Ramadan is coming in the summertime. How much more do we, Wallahi, brothers, I'm happy when Ramadan comes in, in, in the summer. I'm happy when it comes time in the summer because it helps to control desires and it helps you to lower your gaze and it helps you um, uh, to, to develop taqwa, right? And what is taqwa? Taqwa is from the word wiqaya, which means a barrier and a protection. A barrier and a protection from what, Nabil? Because you were there yesterday, right? Over at TIC? Allah Yusami. Tell you. Taqwa. Anybody know what taqwa means? Oh, no, that's a ibadah. Taqwa, yes. The knowledge and the know-how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not quite. So we said the word taqwa is from the word wiqaya, which means a barrier and a protection. And we're not talking about like the Captain America shield or like a thick plated wall or something like that. A barrier and a protection from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are two things that you need in order to have protection from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is... It is to fulfill the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And it's to stay away from his prohibitions. Whatever he said don't do, just don't do it. Just stay away from it. And when you do those two things, when you do those two things, you have protection from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's taqwa. I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm hoping for his reward so I do what I'm supposed to. I fulfill his commands. I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I don't want him to punish me so I stay away from his prohibitions. That's taqwa. Now, and Ramadan is one of the ways to develop that. Ramadan, shahar shukr lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa, um, fasting the month of Ramadan is the month of being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you deprive yourself in the month of Ramadan, you gain an appreciation for the things that you have. When you deprive yourself, deprivation leads to appreciation. When you're deprived of something, you appreciate it that much more. And wallahi, tell, tell me it doesn't happen, brothers. Water is that much more sweeter when you've been fasting for 17 hours. I, I, I almost, I'd be like, what is this sweet nectar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala played? <laughs> placed on the face of this earth that I don't drink it all the time. Wallahi, that's what I, I don't know about y'all. That's what I feel like whenever I, when I'm fasting, I drink water, especially when we was in Medina and those first, that first Ramadan in the sun, Akhi, when it's 120 degrees, we didn't use, we didn't even used to care about eating the food. We just wanted to drink Zum Zum. And you just, you'd have like, you'd have Wallahi, they have these little plastic cups. If y'all, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all to go to Masjid al-Nabwi and to make Umrah and Hajj. Allahumma um, ameen. They have these little plastic cups and you just have like seven or eight or like 10 little plastic cups and just like two, three dates. Be like, khalas, just make it with them. We'll just make it three. So it's an odd number. Right. But the most of it is just water. And it just it just tastes a lot. It just tastes so different. And then the food, it just tastes that much more when you haven't had it all day. Right. But when you eat as much as you want, whenever you want, however you want, you take things for granted. Right. Um, it reminds me of an expression that uh, I heard. I can't recall how it's said in Arabic, but in English, the meaning of it is, right, is that health is a crown on the head. Uh, excuse me, Allah said it, Muhammad. Health, good health, 
is a crown on the head of uh, people that only the sick can see it. Only sick people see it. Because the healthy person, does he look, can he look at his head? He doesn't look at his head. He, he can't see it, right? But the sick people, sick people, they see when, they, when they see a healthy person, right? Because, they don't have, because they're deprived, when they see someone, they appreciate it, right? And so us, it helps us to uh, appreciate what we have. Another thing that it does, and inshallah, I'm just going to forego some of the other things you can go back and read in the book, uh, because the sheikh, he goes on to mention about 12 different uh, benefits and wisdoms behind the month of Ramadan. But I just want to mention a couple of them. The empathy. Um, caring and feeling what other people are going through. This is something that is wanted in Islam. This is something that Islam teaches us, right? And that is especially in the month of Ramadan. Is that there are brothers and sisters before we go all the way to back home and overseas and to other countries, here, brothers and sisters, I personally, I work in social services with a Muslim nonprofit organization. You cannot imagine how many brothers and sisters need help with rent or need help with food. Wallahi, just, just in this last week alone, just in this, this last week alone, there was at least five different people, not the whole organization, just I, had to deliver the food to, or had to help them get the food, right? All Muslim brothers and sisters, families with children. And they're not lazy, they have jobs, but they didn't have enough food. Or they lost their job, and they just lost it, right? And so Ramadan and fasting, it reminds us about our brothers and sisters who are in need. And of course, also those are our brothers and sisters in humanity who also are in need. And of course, our brothers and sisters back home and in other places who may not have. Islam, uh, Ramadan helps us to develop empathy for other people and to think about their situation, where they're coming from. And, and because of that, then you uh, want to reach out and help them. Now.